Hey man, Zach, and welcome back. So, the Saga Tracks is very well known for being really intuitive and easy to use, even if you're going in blind. However, today I want to go through a list of 20 exceptions to that. So, this video is going to include 20 tips that are not very obvious features of this device. Uh, some of them aren't even in the manual at all, and I've just seen them on like Reddit or here on YouTube. But basically, this video is just going to be me compiling a bunch of tips I've found for the circuit tracks that are less obvious and hopefully will help you to make better use of it. So, I have 20 tips and I've split them into three categories. So, we have navigation and storage, sound design, and then sequencing. So, starting off with navigation and storage, uh, the first one if you're just on any page, say you're on the mixer and you want to change, I don't know, say you want to change a parameter in this synth, you can just press the button and go in and tweak the settings you want to change. Alternatively, you can press and hold it and then when you let go, you'll go back to the previous page. So this can be used for making quick changes, like changing the tempo, or like I just did, adjusting a specific parameter of one of these tracks. Um, so you can use this to quickly navigate around and change parameters. The next thing is, you may be aware that when you double tap packs, uh, when you double tap projects or shift press it, you get into the packs, which is basically just a whole machine state. If you don't know what a pack is, I mentioned it in my previous video, which I'll link up. I think it should be up here. Anyway, uh, if you want to put a new pack with different synths and stuff onto your device, you need to use a computer. But if you want to duplicate the same one that you already have into a new slot so that you can make new projects with the same sounds, you can do that. You just hold duplicate. You will notice the only one that is available to press is the currently selected one. So you select the one you want to duplicate, go into it, let it load, and then you hold duplicate, press it, and press a new location and then you have a brand new copy of the exact same pack. That takes a little while, so I'm not going to do it here, but that's how you do it. Next up is VLock. So if we just go into this project, and go into Patterns, you'll see the shift function is called VLock. So if you turn that on, you'll see all the currently selected patterns go white. So then I can go into a new scene, and now you'll see all the flashing ones up here and down here are the ones that are currently playing but for example you'll see you can clearly hear drums right but if you go into the pattern there's nothing there that's because when we turned on vlock we were still in this scene which didn't have any drums so when you turn on vlock every all the patterns will be locked to whatever you currently have selected even if you change what's currently playing so you can use this, say, if you're doing a live jam, you go into a new section and turn on view lock, and then you go back to the previous section, but you can still edit the new one and get it ready while the, your audience can still listen to the previous part. So the next tip is when you're saving a project, um, obviously you can just double tap save and it's saved. But if you go into the projects menu and save it, then you press it once and then you can choose a new location for it. But the thing that I see a lot of people asking about is how do you get all these different colors? So you press save and then the first knob becomes a color wheel and you can choose the color for your project. And then you just press the location and it's saved with this nice green color. So the next tip is something that I've seen people accidentally activate and they don't know it's a feature. Uh, so they don't know how to turn it off, and it, it's, I'll be honest, it's really annoying. Um, so if you go into the setup menu, which you get to by doing shift save, and you'll see you can go to setup, and then you'll see the shift button is slightly red, so you can toggle it onto green, and now the shift button will behave like a toggle, so rather than having, so normally, you have to press and hold shift while you modify different shift options. Whereas if you have the toggle version on, then you can just press it and leave it and you can change all your shift functions and then turn it back off. So this feature is called sticky shift. Um, I can't really imagine wanting this over the normal way it works, but whatever, it's there if you want it. And now if you accidentally turn it on, you know how to turn it back off. Now let's move on to the next category, which is sound design. So I have four tips for you here. So firstly, 
if we're in one of the drum tracks and we just create a simple beat and then let's say we mess with the parameters like we turn up the pitch distort it low pass filter and make it nice and snappy that's where you want to undo that and get it back to the default settings so i would say maximum envelope no distortion the filter would be around there but i have no way of knowing where the original pitch was hold clear and turn the knobs to the right and you'll see they turn blue and you let go back to normal Okay, so the next tip is, say you want to use this sample chromatically. Um, obviously, you can change this pitch and it's not quantized to anything, but it is possible to really be careful and fine tune it. But say you just want to, like this is going to be a really bad example, but say you just want to use this snare drum chromatically for some reason. And you want to record in the parameters well if you try and do that you don't get any kind of preview for what the currently selected like value is so you can go into the velocity menu and now every time you press it you get a preview so now now you could like actually hear what you're doing to it without having to you know, go out of the menu and press play and everything and just, you have a lot more, it's a lot easier and faster to tune samples. So next up is, well, it's just the same tip, but twice. Um, I have an exam, I have a project where I use this. So if you come here and listen to this kick drum, you'll hear it gets more distorted over time. Now, if I go into a different pattern, You'll hear this is the normal sample. So how does it get more distorted over time? Well, it's just turning the envelope up over time. Uh, sorry, it's just turning the distortion up over time. So some other samplers have filter envelopes. Um, so you could do that here. There's no actual filter envelope. You could just automate one of these parameters to control that parameter over time and get sort of an envelope. You just have to either live record it or uh, be very picky about how you sequence it in. That's it for sound design tips. So now let's move on to the final section, which is sequencing. The first thing, so it's say we sequence a drum beat and then you want to live record something in. That was terrible. But like, if you let it play out first and then come in, you'll be fine. But if you want to go straight in and start recording, you'll see it misses the first note because a lot of other devices, they have it so you can press record and then when you press the first note, it will automatically start playing. This, there's no way around it, you just have to let it play through once. Or, if you have quantize on, so what quantize means is if you play it slightly off grid, it will snap it to the nearest note, it will snap it to the nearest beat. So if you intentionally play a tiny bit too late on the first beat and you have quantize on, it will snap it to right on the beat. So. notice it got that one because I played it a tiny bit late, not late enough to be considered this step, just late enough that it would have been one of the micro steps, but it snapped it back to be right on beat. So that is a really useful way to get around the limit. And obviously if you're playing it live, the first time you do that, it will sound off, but then after it's actually recorded and it's just playing from the sequence, it'll sound fine. So next, if you're on the drums and you want to choose a new sample without having to hear it. Say you know what sample you want and you know where it is, but you don't want to play it so your audience won't know what you're doing. Uh, you can just hold shift and press it and you'll notice you don't hear it, but it is changed when you press play. So you can choose samples without auditioning them. Next up, uh, let's just go into a project like that. You'll see. When I press to change the patterns, they're flashing and it waits until the quantize start the start of the next bar to quantize the pattern change. You can get around that by holding shift and everything will change automatically at once. It won't go to the start of the pattern, it will go to that many beats into the pattern. So like if you're halfway through the pattern when you switch, you'll also be halfway through the new pattern. 
um, as you just heard, you can use this. To do drum rolls, um, like very, like just whenever you want. See, this is a bad example because this pattern has like a certain sequence drum roll. But if you just had a pattern that was constant the whole time, then you could just switch to it and just make drum rolls. Um, so the next thing is, say you want, you have a beat and you want to make a slight variation in the second half. Well, you press this button and you get to the second half and you would have to sequence it all in again. And obviously in this example, it's just four notes. It's not that hard, but say you want to, um, so you have like a complex rhythm and melodic content on one of the synth tracks and you want to duplicate it without having to do it all manually. Easy. Hold duplicate, press the 1632 button, and now the second version is exactly the same and you can just make your slight variation. Uh, next up, this again is not really so much of a hidden feature, just a possible application for this device, which is... Um, these synth tracks and drum tracks can be used to send out MIDI as well. Just because they control an internal synth doesn't mean they don't also send out MIDI, because they do. You go into the setup menu, you can choose your track and then control the MIDI channel using these 16 pads. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, so on. Um, and as you can see, the colours of each one determine which channel it's on. So you could set it up as a 5 track MIDI sequencer. And I say five because all the drums are sent to the same channel. So if you change it, it changes for all of them. So you could have four melodic tracks and one drum track. The only problem with this is, well, for one, then you can only play four drums at a time, which may be inconvenient. So then you could use one of the MIDI tracks uh, to control to control a drum machine. Uh, anyway, the big issue, uh, well, depending on what resources you have. The big issue might be that normally you would take the audio from the MIDI tracks and bring that audio back in and use the internal mixer because that's one of the main features of this device. But you can't do that if you have five external devices. So if you were going to do that, you'd need an external mixer. The next tip is uh, I've seen people complaining that the amount of patterns on here is only eight and that's a bit limiting. While I kind of agree, I've never really run into that as a problem. But one option for something you can do is you can just put, be playing a project. When you go to a new one, you'll notice that it does the same flashing thing and then it synchronizes it right on the beat before it transitions. So it will transition in time. It will modify the tempo of the new project to match the first one. So you can have seamless transitions between projects, which you can use as basically just extra patterns if you need them. The next feature is if you want to have a chord and you want to have it strum, like how on a guitar when you play a chord, each note comes slightly after the last one because you have to like physically hit all the strings like this, rather than just all hitting at once. Well, you can do that. Obviously, if you want to live record it and you turn off quantize, then they'll be slightly off beat from each other. But you can also sequence this in. So if you put your chord on this beat and then you go into micro steps, uh, you'll see there are three green pads and each of these are the separate notes. So you can put each one on a different micro step. You can also like just make the gate longer. And then you'll hear each one is on a different micro step. Uh, maybe I'll move them along and then get rid of this note, put it on the next one, do this, yeah, there you go. So now you can hear, um, you can use these micro steps to create chord strums. So next up, if you take a look at some of the demo projects in the, um, in the factory content pack, you'll see that they just sequence all the scenes in a row and it just plays through them all. If you want to do that, but you want some of your scenes to be longer than each other, um, and you don't have any MIDI devices plugged in, you can just chain like all the MIDI patterns together and use that to basically force it to play for longer. You can also like go into it, put it on two bar mode and also go into the pattern settings and make it play really slowly. 
Um, so, and then you can just sort of do the maths and figure out exactly how long it needs to be to make the scene play for as long as you want. Uh, I can't remember if it's an issue, but I think maybe if you have empty patterns, it will just ignore that. Um, it, like it will ignore the timing in terms of s switching to the next scene. But since they're MIDI tracks and you don't have anything plugged in, you can just sequence notes, but it won't matter because they're not actually controlling anything. Two more tips for sequencing. One, if you go into the tempo menu, um, you'll see the fifth knob is lit up. Uh, you can change the volume of the click. I've never seen anyone mention this anywhere. It's not in the manual either, but I would argue it's very useful for being able to have a quiet metronome or a loud metronome if you want it. And then the last tip is simply the difference between the this mutate function up here and the random playing order. If I go into pattern settings, uh, these four control the play order. So you got forwards, backwards, ping pong, which means forwards and then backwards, or random. But what you can do instead of random is if you hold shift and press duplicate, you'll mutate the pattern and now it's permanently changed within the actual sequence, the order of the notes. So now it's random, but it's the same type of random every time. So each time it like it'll change the sequence, but it will play back the same way every time, rather than if you make it random. It's unlikely to repeat the same thing over. So that is all the tips for this video. So hopefully you found them useful and you'll be able to make better and more efficient use of your circuit tracks if you have one. Um, if you don't, I highly recommend getting one. I'm going to be posting a full review on it um, probably within the next two weeks. Uh, so stay tuned for that and make sure to subscribe. And once that video comes out, I'll put it at the end of this video. But, so, but yeah, that's it for this video. So if you did enjoy it or find it helpful, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing to my channel. If you have any comments, feedback or suggestions, leave them down below in the comment section. And other than that, thank you very, very much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.